Hello, everybody. Welcome to um, a virtual program from Basel Book Company and the Urban Ecology Center, both based in Milwaukee. Um, I'm Daniel Golden from Boswell. We are so honored to be hosting the author of um, The Rescue Effect, The Key to Saving Life on Earth. Um, the book is has received uh, wonderful write-ups, including from Ray Hilborn, the co-author of Ocean Recovery, who wrote The Rescue Effect is both a whirlwind tour of conservation issues from around the world and an ecologist's insight into how biodiversity on Earth could survive a range of human impacts, the most important being climate change. Michael Mado Webster, the author, is an expert in ecology, conservation, and philanthropy, as well as an ardent nature enthusiast. Webster is a professor of practice in the Department of Environmental Studies at New York University. Uh, he earned a PhD in zoology at Oregon State University and a BS in zoology from uh, Madison's very own University of Wisconsin. For this event, which is co-sponsored by the Urban Ecology Center and its three campuses. We are very honored to have Minal Ater, the Corporate and Foundations Manager at the Urban Ecology Center, uh, one of our favorite partners. And uh, we are so grateful for both of you uh, joining us tonight. Welcome. Wonderful, thanks for having us. Thank you so much for having me uh, in this conversation. I'm really excited. Um, yeah, as mentioned, uh, my name is Mina Latre, and I work as a foundation and relations manager at the Urban Ecology Center. Uh, it is a local environmental and a community uh, center in, in Milwaukee with three branches and offer um, environmental programs for K to grades, as we call it. Uh, so uh, super excited to introduce um, uh, and join this conversation with um, ecology and philanthropy expert and the author of The Rescue Effect, The Key to Saving Life on Earth, uh, Mike Omeja Webster. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So I will start the conversation with the question that we um, very frequently asked at Urban Ecology Center. Um, that is, what was your connection to nature before you began the conservation work? Huh. So I decided I was going to become a marine biologist when I was four years old. And I grew up not far from where you guys are. I grew up just south of Madison in Stoughton, Wisconsin. And I watched Jacques Cousteau specials when I was little. And I just thought that what he was able to show in the ocean around the world was just the most magical, amazing thing that I'd ever seen. Not, you know, no, no issue with cornfields, but the idea of going to a coral reef really, really inspired me. And so I, I was that weird kid that not only made this decision at a really early age, but I actually stuck to it. And I went on to become a marine biologist and work on coral reefs, which is what I wanted to work on. And so I would say that for as long as I can remember, I've had this really strong interest in nature and wanting to explore and understand it. Uh, I'm just amazed that you knew what the marine biologist was at the age of four. <laughs> And then persisted that journey. So good <laughs> to you. Uh, I yeah, I don't think I I had any idea of what coral reefs were when I was four. Um, so 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 from uh, going to you know the nearby nature that was around you in Wisconsin, because definitely you know we're far from the ocean. Um, how how did you find that path to to go towards you know the coastal areas across the world? Yeah, and don't get me wrong, I've always been fascinated by all nature and, you know, spent my time as a kid, you know, raising frogs and catching butterflies and climbing trees and identifying birds. I was always outside, always trying to understand what's going on around me. Uh, so um, I did have a particular love for at least the idea of the ocean. But truth be told, I didn't see the ocean until I was 17. Um, and then saw it only briefly. And then when I was 18, I decided I wasn't ready to go to college. Um, and in order to learn about the ocean, the right thing to do would be to move to the Caribbean and become a dive master. So I went on my very first uh, commercial airline flight of my life. It was a one-way flight to St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands, where I became a dive master and dove on coral reefs every day. And yeah, there was no question. I was like, yep, this is it. So then I had to figure out 
uh, how, how do I get to there from here, right? And what do I have to do? So I realized I had to go back to school. So I came back to Wisconsin. I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, got a great undergraduate degree. And from there went on to, um, you know, do PhD research. And, you know, as I finished my PhD work and was doing research thereafter, I, I made sort of an important decision in this process though, was that I was gonna step away from being a day-to-day -day scientist, which is what I was training for, and start working more quickly on conservation issues. And because, you know, I was seeing nature changing around me and I wanted to figure out what can I do to try and help. Awesome, wonderful. Uh, so you have worked extensively on coral reef conservation. Um, can you talk about uh, a little bit about what that conservation looked like and what was your, uh, work there? Sure. Yeah, so my my research training is in trying to understand coral reefs, and I always liked the fish on coral reefs, and that's what I worked on for research. But the issue with coral reefs, the biggest issue for coral reefs from a conservation perspective is not about the fish right now, it's about the corals themselves. So corals are these really strange creatures that, you know, unless you're a diver or keep a saltwater tank, they seem really sort of odd and foreign because they grow kind of like trees. Uh, they build these rocky structures, but they're they're animals. They're not mm -hmm. plants. And when you go to a coral reef and you see these amazing, you know, structures around and these caves and you know promontories, those are all built out of coral and other organisms that build these rocky skeletons. So they're actually making that whole reef ecosystem. But in the last 40 or so years, we've started to see real problems with coral reefs around the world. And, you know, even when I was doing my PhD research in the Bahamas in the early 2000s, you know, we had a major uh, El Nino event, which the water got really warm and all the coral, which was usually these mustardy and brown and different colors, it all started turning ghostly white. And this is something that's become really common. Um, since about the 1970s, which is coral bleaching. And it's a sign that the corals are in water that's uh, too warm for them. And they're trying to survive. It basically shows that they're in acute stress. And when this happens, oftentimes the corals will die. And um, what coral reef conservation is trying to figure out right now is, well, how do we help these organisms adjust to a world that is much warmer than what they've experienced in their recent history. And are we gonna lose those corals in the process? Is there anything we can do to try and prevent that? Awesome. Um, I have seen corals um, when I visited um, Keys uh, last year and my life has never been the same. I will say that. <laughs> and uh, it, is, um, it is hard to imagine uh, a world without any, any of these beautiful species. And uh, your book addresses just that, that, you know, with uh, the extension at its rapid uh, rate that we're seeing right now, how, how do we, um, you know, uh, first come to terms with this extension, um, you know, as we're losing species, I, I think uh, I read 200 a year um, is what I'm hearing, but the numbers change um, every, literally every day as to how many species are dying every day. Um, and uh, your book was such a wonderful um, change into the perspective of the way we look at it. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the way you addressed, um, you know, uh, just, the, just the conservation in general. But when we think about climate change, and, and I'm coming from a point where um, I do a lot of um, education uh, through Urban Ecology Center and as a community member on plastics pollution and how it is changing, you know, our environment around us and how how it's affecting the environment around us. And what every time we talk about it, uh, it is basically a negative uh, feeling that we, we we're just doomed. There is nothing that we can do about this. And this is what is going to happen. So when we think about it, we always think about how to stop what is happening from you know what is happening rather than uh you know what your book focuses on how we can actually make sure that the life in all forms can survive and thrive in this constantly and rapidly changing environment and how it can continue to survive um with with the changes that are happening um how did you gain that perspective of looking at conservation versus how do we stop from whatever is happening in this world right now and change the clock back so listen, there's plenty to be upset about 
when, you know, if you're a nature lover and care about species and ecosystems, because things are changing really quickly and things that we value are at risk or have already been lost. And so, you know, I've worked in conservation for a long time and there are plenty of sort of you know, sad stories, there are plenty of uh, risks. And we do oftentimes get caught up in this realm of sort of doom and gloom. And um, one of the experiences that I had about a decade ago, I took over uh, as the executive director of an organization called Coral Reef Alliance. And our mission was about saving coral reefs around the world. And as I started working in this new job, I started wondering, is that something we can do? You know, and it's just sort of this is this are we at a point in our history? We've actually lost coral reefs. Is that the situation we're in? Is the world changing so fast that there's really nothing we can do to get in front of this and corals are going to be lost and their reefs are then going to be lost as we know them? And I was wondering, you know, whether that was true or whether there was something we could do to get in front of it, what would that look like? And what I wasn't finding was a very clear answer in this field. It was sort of surprising to me because it's like, well, this is what we're doing. Why is anybody answered this question? So I went to a whole bunch of experts in conservation, in science, and I said, okay, can you tell me, you know, can corals make it through this period of time? And, and if so, what can we do to help them? And I mostly got blank stares and like, wow, that's a really good question. We should answer that. It's like, well, how can we not answer that and do this work? And so I started pulling together a team of scientists and conservation professionals, and I got some money in place to, to do some work and said, hey, let's, let's do our best job at trying to answer this question. <clears throat> and the way we approached it is we built basically a mathematical coral reef and ran sort of scenarios where we said, okay, imagine this reef is hit by this amount of climate change, how might it respond? <clears throat> and we allowed the corals in the model to both change ecologically to move to different places through reproduction and whatnot. We also allowed them to evolve new capabilities and we tried to make the model as realistic as possible. And as we were doing this, we kept getting the same kind of answer and we ran the model many different ways with different parameters and blah, 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 blah. But the answer was pretty much always the same, which is that corals actually can do a pretty decent job of adjusting to environmental change, including climate change to a degree. And that there are good reasons to think that they actually can make it through this period of change we've created on the planet. However, they can't do everything. And if we choose to do nothing about climate change and have the climate change you know, really quickly um, and extremely over the next century or so, the chances of that happening get lower and lower. <clears throat> but if instead we begin to bend the curve on climate, and we do other things to manage coral reefs in the locations where they're found, we came up with some pretty optimistic scenarios. And so I looked at that and I thought, huh, that's better than I thought it might be, which is maybe we haven't lost this ecosystem. And more importantly, we actually have agency here. We have the ability to affect this outcome through both working at a global scale on climate and working at a regional scale on things like you know, protecting reefs locally. And I find that actually fairly powerful. To me, I get dismayed when the answer is always, we can't do this, everything is you know, going away, it's all dying, it's all gonna be gone. To me, I find it far more motivating to actually feel like we can actually make a difference here and our actions can make a difference here. And so as I would talk to more colleagues in my field, what I found was that just this concept that, that you know, based on the data, we actually think we can do this, it was actually really motivating for people in a way that was different from how we'd been talking about this work before. And so I started to wonder, and this is really the inspiration for the book, which is, um, well, that was an interesting experience on coral reefs. What's going on in other ecosystems? And how should we be thinking about conservation more broadly in this world that's changing so quickly? How can we get in front of some of these problems? And what should we expect from nature in terms of its ability to adapt to changes like this? Wonderful. Um, you have talked about, um, I don't want to give away too much as to what is in the in the book <laughs> itself, because I think everybody should read it. It, was, um, it, it kept me hooked, um, uh, because in, in the beginning, you have talked about uh, six different rescue processes, and I was like, tell me more. Um, <laughs> and so uh, how, how that process came about of, you know, these six different ways that you thought that the conservation uh, or the, the earth can and can have a rescue effect. Yeah, so maybe I'll start my answer to that question with the definition for what is the rescue effect. 
And the rescue effect, as I use it in the book, is this um, uh, sort of automatic response by nature that when an organism or a group of organisms is confronted with a world that's changing, there are all these different processes that turn on automatically that help those organisms adjust to the change. In the book, I describe it as being like a thermostat. If you're in a room and it's hot outside and the temperature is rising, if there's an air conditioner on a thermostat, at some point you're gonna trigger that thermostat, it's gonna come on automatically and it's gonna begin cooling down the room. In nature, there are a whole bunch of systems that work something like that, where they turn on automatically and they help organisms adjust to that change. And so as I was starting to look at different ecosystems, looking at you know, cichlid fish in Africa and salmon in Alaska and chestnut trees in North America and obviously corals, I started to think, you know, really when we think about the response of nature, there's, there's sort of a, a limited subset of these different things that are possible. And so I ended up breaking it down into the six that you're describing. And so that's my take on what is available to nature all on its own for dealing with change. But you also mentioned sort of finding, you know, getting hooked while you're reading the book. One of the things that I was really worried about early on is I didn't want to write like a textbook. You know, I've given plenty of lectures and I've read plenty of textbooks and you can convey information in a clear way that sort of goes through this point and then this point and then this point and then this point, fine. But I didn't think that would be as fun of an experience uh, for a reader reading this book. And so what I tried very hard to do was to make all of those things come alive, not by going through them in systematic order, but by using stories about real world organisms and real places and real conservation campaigns to try and invite people inside to what's going on in ecology, what's going on in evolution and what's going on in conservation. So what I'm trying to do in the book is give the reader sort of this, this, this unusual insight into how this is playing out in the real world and try and keep them engaged through these stories. Um, I think I think you nailed it by, um, you know, what was the hook for me was that this was not just the facts and, and data that I was reading about, but it was actual stories. Each chapter had a story that I had, you know, a chance to follow and, and, and read about as to how that conservation and that rescue effect took place in that in that effort. Um, and I think that was a, that was very interesting uh, for me. I think your um, first chapter um, talks about the tiger conservation in India and how it became a um, a success story. Um, and uh, my my husband is actually from the similar um, same area where the the story takes place. And I remember never ever uh, you know we've been together twenty five years and I've never heard him ever talk about I heard a tiger when I was walking around uh, in, in, in their farmhouse uh, to like, I actually saw the tiger crossing the street today. And um, there has been that big shift into how, how the conservation has just been uh, you know successful with the tiger conservation in India. But you also brought a very good point about the growth of that conservation and how it sustainable it will be in the future. Uh, especially with the economic development and also the human development that is happening around. And what I have known is that the, the protected areas and the and the conservation area and the urban setting where people um, have uh, access to urban development, it's it's not too far from each other. They live very closely with each, with each other, and they both continue to grow. You know. Um, and um, so I think you you brought in a very wonderful point in the book that uh, made me feel that every everything has to fall in place. It cannot just be that the nature takes place on its own, uh, but the people uh, and the community that surrounds these areas and affect these areas also need to be part of this conservation. And for them to join, there has to be an economic growth that goes with it, that supports these people. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about about how that collaboration looked like when you were um, doing the research? Sure. So you're talking about the tiger parks in Madhya Pradesh in mm -hmm. basically central India. 
um, uh, th that's my first chapter. And I, I started with that chapter because it, uh, it ended up being a really interesting story about this particular tiger and his journey across the landscape through farms, connecting these two sort of isolated parks that are now sort of fragmented in the landscape. And there's lots of questions about how parks are going to work in the future as you get sort of development and these little islands of parks and, and whether animals can move, move between them. And so when I first started working on the chapter, that was sort of where I began. Uh, but as I was researching it, the story just kept unfolding. And I didn't know about the backstory of the park where this tiger came from had been, the tigers there had been hunted to extinction. And they'd been hunted to extinction uh, to help feed an international black market for tiger parts. Um, and it was a really fascinating story. How about once that happened, that was very embarrassing to the Indian government and they decided to rectify that situation. So they brought in tigers from other parks, they reestablished the population. And what happened was within a couple of generations that park filled up with tigers uh, again, which is really kind of remarkable. But one thing they also did was um, they made an, ex uh, an explicit effort to work with the particular community that was doing the poaching of the tigers. So this is a group in India called the Pardi tribe. And they uh, have long been uh, hunters, their ancestors have long been hunters. And it, it, this is a little bit different from what we experience in this country because this group was really excluded from access to what we would think of as you know, economic, economic opportunities. Their children didn't go to school, they didn't learn to write, there was no education. And then that meant there was no access into any other way of working. And so what else are they gonna do? They're gonna do what their parents did, which is hunt. And so there's this sort of self-perpetuating lifestyle that's like, how do you resolve that? Well, in the chapter, I talk about how um, the, the um, forest management organizations, as well as the nonprofits, helped to um, create an alternative for these people who only knew how to hunt in this system. And I actually was able to visit them earlier this year um, uh, in, in Pana City and see the place they live. And actually members of the tribe took me out on a, on a jungle walk and showed me their world through their eyes, which was absolutely extraordinary. And what's happened is that now that this community has another set of economic alternatives, people within that group are starting to become, for example, nature guides. The people who used to be the poachers who know the jungle better than anybody else in the world are now to inviting people in to see the wildlife that's there, which is a really sort of exciting idea and exciting shift. But the point that you made, which is a really important one is that people are much more likely to participate in what we think of as conservation if they have an incentive to. And in this case, the incentives shifted for that group of people from incentives towards poaching to incentives towards actually protecting the things that they used to hunt. Uh, this rings so true because um, this is basically is the model of urban ecology center. Uh, we connect people in the cities to nature and each other. And our focus is that if you want to uh, have a conservation of any area that's a protected green space, whether it's a river or a park or just an urban forest that you are creating, um, if you don't connect the people that live nearby, um, you know, you're, you're missing out on an important piece of the conservation is, you know, and that is that is one of the focuses that we bring people that live within the two mile radius and show them this is what is happening in their neighborhood, in their backyards, practically. Uh, and connect them to that. And they they kind of feel this sense of connection and ownership to it. And then they started like, yeah, I walk this trail every single day and I've noticed changes in it. Um, and they sort of kind of uh, become the citizen science for, for the center and start to to help us with the research and the conservation. Um, and I, I particularly enjoyed that piece so much about the parties and how the government kind of realized that you know, there, there's a disconnect over there that they need to work on. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, just this, the current state of um, the climate anxiety uh, and how the, the youth, especially, um, I interact with a lot of younger um, younger um, humans and, the, and, and the way they perceive that the, the climate change is. And there was an interesting study that came out that uh, was conducted in 10 different countries over 10,000 uh, use. And 59% of them uh, feel very worried or extremely worried about the climate change. Uh, and at the same time, they feel paralyzed as they feel like they're hopeless. There's nothing that they can do about it. Um, and, you know, when we read about the climate, it's basically that all that news is depressing. So 
your book offers this cautiously optimistic view uh, towards the climate change where it says, hold on, we're going to lose some, but let's just figure out, you know, what is it that we need to prioritize and how we can change that. Where do you get this optimism from? Yeah, so my optimism comes from sort of what I think nature is capable of, I mean, you know, basically how strong the rescue effect is in nature. It also comes from what I think we can accomplish for trying to uh, help organisms and ecosystems persist. But that's predicated on, on the notion that we are going to make more meaningful progress on climate change. We're not there yet. And the, the, the problem is if we don't, from if we're just talking about like species and biodiversity, because there's all sorts of other things we could be talking about as well, for lots of organisms, what's gonna happen is that they're pretty good at adjusting to changes. But there's two things that make it harder, if the change is really fast or if it's really large. And the problem with climate change is it's creating both of those things at the same time. It's a lot of change happening over a short period of time. And that's when it gets much harder for organisms to adapt to change. And so what will happen is that the faster and more the climate changes, the more things we will actually start to lose because the rescue effect will get overwhelmed and we can try and intervene. But you know, eventually there's going to be so many different things going on. We, we, we may not be able to intervene everywhere and we'll start losing more species. We'll start losing more ecosystems. Um, uh, that said, if we choose a different path, which is beginning to chip away at climate, beginning to bend that curve down you know, away from the trajectory that we're on, then I think it's actually going to have a really meaningful um, uh, benefit to life everywhere, because we're not talking about you know a localized threat that's affecting this species or this ecosystem. Climate change is affecting all species and all ecosystems. I've done this sort of thought experiment. It's like, can I come up with any species or any any ecosystem that's not being affected by climate change? And I have yet to. So if you've got one, I'd love to hear it. The closest I've come to is maybe hydrothermal vents, but <laughs> see what you can come up with. The, the, so, so I am generally optimistic, but I also believe that humanity is chipping away at climate change and that I'm hopeful that we're gonna get more and more momentum on that in the decades to come. If we don't, this scenario won't be as rosy. Um, I hope so too. I just wanna quickly remind you if anybody has questions, you can put it in a um, QA uh, session or in the chat as well. Um, and I'm happy to uh, read them for you. Uh, I was thinking about how uh, how local the climate problem is. I think um, climate change, when we talk about it, or actually any any problem that is so massive uh, that, you know, when we talk about paralyzing effect, that you feel like there's just nothing one person can do or one human being can not change anything about it. And we saw that in, in some ways during, um, you know, COVID-19 pandemic, where it just spread so fast, so quickly across the globe. And, and the way we tackle, um, which is what I, I believe in, is, is locally at the small scale and focusing on your own areas and your own, um, own way of um, making sure that what surrounds you is healthy and, um, and safe. And I, I've talked about that a little bit with, with plastic pollution too, when people say like, oh, we can't survive without plastic, it's everywhere. Um, I can't go zero waste or low waste, that's just not my lifestyle. And we're like, okay, we're just gonna focus on one area at a time and one focus at a time. How, how do we do that when it comes to, to picking as to which conservation effort you wanna work on? Do you wanna work on plants or species? Or do you wanna work on insects or bugs? Or do you wanna look at a bigger picture uh, which are like symbolic like tigers or polar bears that we all know are significantly a threat? How, how do we figure out like where you wanna put your energy in? I mean, my general advice in there is go where you're passionate. Um, there's plenty to do. So if you want to work on tigers, great. If you want to work on, you know, um, restoring vacant lots in Milwaukee, fantastic. That's awesome. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, there isn't a right answer to what an individual needs to be doing on this. On the climate front, you know, individuals can do something about their own footprint and they can try and influence 
broader decisions, you know, as well, particularly through things like voting or supporting organizations that are working on climate change, great. Um, uh, but then if you really care about a particular place or a particular set of species or a particular, you know, way of interacting with the natural world, great, go for it and put your energy and effort into that. This is one of the fun things about working on this book is that I got to talk with, you know, scientists and conservation professionals, and managers and all sorts of folks across all these different places around the world in all these different ecosystems working on all these different problems. And their stories were really interesting. But the thing that bound all of them together is that they were really passionate about what they were doing. And that's fantastic. So yeah, go with what you're passionate about. I was passionate about coral reefs. I grew up around cornfields. How did that happen? Yeah, I don't know, but it did. Um, I was going to say that where you uh, are planted has nothing to do with where your passion can lie. Um, so <laughs> uh, that's a wonderful reminder. Uh, I, I, when I was reading about the um, the chestnut chapter about um, you know how that was uh, wiped out, almost wiped out with the um, with the uh, with a fungal infection, and I think we're we're seeing something similar every time I read the chapter that. Um, I probably did not uh, know about or was not around when it was happening, but there's some similar story that is happening currently. And we have emerald ash borer that's killing our ash trees right now, yep. wiping out you know, some big forests. And um, that brings attention to, again, the biodiversity, right? And, and making sure that we have um, not the monoculture. Um, your take on that as to how, can we save ash trees? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I believe the answer is yes. In an interesting twist of fate, two weeks ago, I um, gave a talk at the American Chestnut Foundation's annual meeting. They invited me to come down and talk with them and got to meet lots of the people who are working on these trees, including people working on emerald ash borer. Um, and uh, yeah, they actually think, if I'm remembering my facts correctly, please don't quote me on this, but they actually think that there's enough resistance to emerald ash borer in existing ash trees, they can actually just do selective breeding of the existing trees to try and produce a new strain that can withstand this. Um, but the problem for North American trees, particularly Eastern trees, is that um, there's, there's a bunch of stories that are like this. So this story that I talked about in the book is the story of the American chestnut and how the introduction of a fungal disease nearly wiped that tree out and people have been trying for 100 years to bring it back. Um, and they're right on the precipice of perhaps doing that, but it comes with, you know, some caveats. Um, I think the American chestnut's an interesting story because it shows how much people can do when they really put their hearts and their minds toward it to try and bring back this species that would have been pretty easy to write off in the past and say is probably doomed. Um, uh, the good news is that as other species are facing similar problems, there's now some precedent for the kinds of things people can do. And there are people out there who are experienced and working with many of these trees. And so all of the diseases that you're seeing to, you know, to ash and to elm, um, some to oak, and this was obviously to chestnut, um, people are working uh, to try and resolve those with progress. They, you know, this, they're, not, they're not beating their head against a wall. They're actually making tangible progress and moving toward trees that are going to do better at surviving in this sort of new world with a new climate and lots of new pests that have been introduced from around the world. Um, that gives me hope. I have a beautiful ash tree in my front yard um, that gets um, an annual vaccine as I call it oh yeah <laughs> to, to, yeah and and um it it definitely makes me nervous every time I see something I'm like is this gonna make it and I'm told it's a very healthy one and has a very good chance of survival but I have also seen you know some of the urban forest just being completely wiped out um with the emerald sure. ash borer sure. and when I was a student on the Wisconsin campus I mean I grew up running around that campus as a kid you know, there are all these giant stately elm trees that ran up, you know, one of the hills on campus is beautiful scene. And, you know, those all died um, back, you know, when I was a student and they've been replaced by a more diverse group of trees. Uh, but there's also a lot of bit of progress, a lot on that disease as well. And so elm trees are coming back too. Um, your perspective on how the earth or the nature given time can come up with its own method of, um, you know, evolving and changing. Uh, and at Urban Ecology Center, we see this uh, not as a, as a as an evolution of one species, um, but in general, we feel that urban trees go through a lot compared to the 
the one that are you know protected in in forest in 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 uh, less human interaction that happens in in those areas, uh, and and we think that they are quite resilient more than so than some of the you know um, the one that are in the wilderness. Yeah, so I I think it's interesting. So I've worked in conservation for a long time, and there are some sort of long standing general beliefs in conservation around, you know, the right groups of species, the right kinds of ecosystems. They're supposed to have this species and that abundance and that species and that abundance. This is what it's supposed to look like. Well, nature doesn't really work that way. Nature is always changing. It's always experimenting. It's always trying new combinations. And I talked about this just briefly in the book, but you know, there's an idea in ecology called novel ecosystems, where you're bringing together new species in new combinations in new ways. And in conservation, just the idea of these systems has long been sort of something that was considered of lesser value in conservation more broadly. And I think that's a really huge mistake. Because to me, I think it's fascinating how life can re reinvent itself and reorganize in an absolutely endless set of different patterns and combinations. There is no one right way for nature to be. Nature can work it out in many different ways. And so I love hearing about the kind of work you're doing because you, you know, you're getting to work in these systems that are very different from what you might've found in that same place 500 or 5,000 or 50,000 years ago. And yet it still has a lot of value. It has value in terms of the species that are supported, in terms of the experiences that people have. You know, I went for a run, I live in Manhattan along the waterfront today. And, you know, I was looking at all these amazing trees and seeing the robins coming down to the puddles for drinks and chickadees flying by and thinking, you know, this is not the most diverse ecosystem I've ever seen, but it's beautiful. And it's giving me a little bit of inspiration as I'm cruising along on my run. Uh, definitely, we 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 kid around at Urban Ecology Center that um, the beavers are back uh, in the Milwaukee <laughs> River, and they have been missing for over twenty years. And um, that was such a delight for for the the everybody who has been working to restore green spaces in Milwaukee and in other neighborhoods. Um, but that also means that <laughs> you lose the trees. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And so our land stewardship team is like, okay, we will handle this. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll plant more tea, trees because, you know, they both just go hand in hand. And it just is a sign of a healthy ecosystem if the beavers are back. Um, but that also means that you have to change your focus and, and see what you need to do yeah. in order to make sure that you still have the canopy. Uh, so the reed canary grass is not taking over. And so it's, it's an interesting approach that once you create a plan, uh, you got to keep changing it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what, uh, what you really, I, I, when I read the book, I felt very hopeful. Uh, but I also know that that doesn't mean that we as humans are off the hook, you know, just because nature, um, has this ability to adapt and change and species, many of them, as you put it, might, might make it through. Um, uh, so what, what do you think, uh, what are your hopes from this book and the readers when they do it? Because I felt hopeful, but I work so deeply in conservation that I also know at the same time that I'm not off the hook. Yeah. Well, and I think that's great. And that's what I would love people to take away from it. Listen, I want them to have some fun with this book. That's why I read it, wrote it in this sort of story format and took them to cool places and amazing systems. So I, I hope people enjoy it, but I'd like them to leave it with this sense of, okay, you know, we can do this. It doesn't mean just sitting back and watching nature do its thing. It means actually intervening in some important ways, including things like dealing with climate, including, you know, trying to help those species that are struggling the most. But it's not hopeless. We're not at a point, you know, you, you've probably heard of like the sixth extinction and this concept that we're going to lose a large fraction of Earth's diversity. That may come to pass, but it has not yet come to pass. You know, at this point, we've lost a tiny fraction of 1% of the species on, on the planet. Um, almost everything that was there when we started getting more abundant and taking over is still there. And, and so I think that's really good news because it means we're not predestined to see biodiversity, you know, erode precipitously in the future. Um, but we are absolutely not off the hook. Um, but we do have a choice. And I find a choice um, far more motivating than a lack of a choice. Uh, I'm a hopeless optimist. Uh, you provide a cautious, <laughs> optimistic view. Uh, I I just feel like everything is going to be all right because people in deep their hearts want want to see everything that's you know 
right now there for them to see. We do have one question from uh, Peg Cadigan, I believe. Uh, given that insects are able to evolve more quickly because they reproduce in a short time, why do you think they seem to be in immediate trouble? Uh, and there's a, it's a double question. And because plankton and insect and other uh, not glamorous species like birds and whale uh, need whales need, uh, how can people help them? Yeah, um, there's a lot to unpack there, and I want to begin with sort of stating I'm no expert on insects. Um, uh, you know, one of the reasons you might see insects being in trouble is that there's a lot of them. They're really, really diverse. Um, they're certainly the most diverse group of animals once you factor in the beetles. Um, uh, and many of them have evolved fairly specialized life cycles and lifestyles. And so that just means that the, there's a greater chance of coming across insects that might be struggling. Um, you are also correct that certain forms of evolution do happen faster when you have um, shorter life spans. And we've seen this with like a lot of evolution in insects against things like, you know, um, pesticides uh, and ability to, to um, deal with things that they wouldn't be able to in the past. And what's going on there is a process called uh, evolutionary rescue, where when an organism is faced with a really extreme change in its environment and really high mortality rates, um, there's some chance that will evolve new capabilities to deal with that changing environment. And it used to be in conservation, we didn't really think of evolution as being super relevant to modern day conservation because conservation is usually things that are happening on the scale of years to decades where evolution, we often think of it as taking place over millions of years. But that's not entirely true about evolution. Evolution can actually happen really quickly. In fact, it can happen instantaneously. All you need for evolution to happen is for to have a group of organisms. Some of them are different from each other. Something causes uh, um, some of them to die and the other ones survive. So long as the reasons those ones survived has something to do with their, um, their genes, then evolution happens in that instant. Um, and that's the kind of evolution we see a lot in conservation, which is an organism is faced with some new challenge. Some fraction of the population doesn't survive because of that challenge. Another fraction does. Um, if that trait is, is heritable, evolution starts to happen there. And what we're seeing is that the more we look for these kinds of things that we didn't necessarily used to think even would be there, the more we're finding them. And I think, you know, corals is one of those places where we think there's some evolution going on. One of the examples I gave in the book was about some fish in Lake Victoria in Africa that appear to be evolving at ridiculously fast rates. And while they may be a lot faster than other organisms, I think evolution is actually part of what's going to happen here. Um, let me pause there. And, you know, why don't you remind me of um, uh, elements of the question that I've missed? I remember there were a lot of them and I don't think I've hit all of them. Um, I think um, the second part of the question was, you know, because these are not the glamorous species, the the insects and the planktons. How can how can people help them? They're not they're not as iconic as as tigers and whales. Yeah, and that's a great point. You know, my sort of anecdotal observation in conservation is that, um, you know, the species that get the most effort are the ones that have the biggest constituency. So if there's a lot of people who care about a species, then people put a lot of effort. American chestnut tree is a great example of a tree people just did not want to see go away. They put enormous effort in that. Tigers and whales are other good examples. Um, you know, I don't know the ecology of the insects well enough, but I'm sure there are things you can do in terms of, you know, creating backyard habitat or creating different kinds of habitat that serve different groups of insects because it, it's not all insects that will, will do well there. Um, but the other thing is you can take that on and you can draw attention to it. You can build your constituency. You know, one of the chapters in the book is about this funny little marsupial that lives in the mountaintops of Australia that people thought was extinct. They, they, didn't, they didn't realize that it was actually still living. It was only known from fossils. And after it was discovered, you know, a few decades later, now it was actually starting to go extinct. And so not many people even knew that this thing existed. Now it's furry and it's got big eyes, so that's a leg up. But it was a pretty much unknown species that people who wanted to protect it, they actually built a campaign. And they said, we're gonna tell people about this species. We're gonna try and get them interested in this species. Um, and we're gonna try and build support for getting it uh, better protected. And they've been pretty successful in that. So if you know, you've got a particular insect or group of insects that you think are deserve more attention, well, so develop a campaign and bring other people along. 
I, I think that's such a great advice. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, when we think about conservation um, and s similar to plastic pollution, and I keep going back to plastic pollution because that's where my passion lies. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, when we talk about it and how, how, why, why the plastic bags and why just the straws when there's everything else that's made with plastic? Why are we focusing on that? And a lot of times, I feel like they are um, almost like a symbol for for that uh, problem. And once you start looking into it, you kind of go slowly deeper in it, and I'm like, okay, well, what other than straw can I do? So. Sometimes, uh, you know, you might start with whales and you might start with birds and then you start to read the effect of how it's coming down, trickling down to your, you know, little bugs, monarch <laughs> butterflies, right? Um, I mean, there's a, there's a big, big movement right now as they got listed as endangered species and, and people want to plant milkweed. And so, so I think a lot of times uh, I, I can give you a good example of it is that I live in a very small community. Uh, just um, north of Milwaukee, Shorewood. And uh, there are members that are passionate about bumblebees. And so we have a bumblebee brigade now, and we're documenting species, and we have a pollinator palooza that's happening. And so I think, I think, like you mentioned, if you have passion for something that's not as, um, uh, that's not a poster child. <laughs> uh, I think can, you can, can make I jump that in a poster on child. Yeah, that's fantastic. Can I jump in on one thing there? You mentioned monarchs, and it's interesting because the news about monarchs being endangered came out this summer, and I decided to do some digging on this because I was curious um, about how monarchs were doing as a species. And you know, it wasn't very hard to figure out that the, the monarchs that are in trouble are the migratory monarchs in North America. So these are the ones that overwinter in Mexico and come back, you know, in in the east, um, and they've had population declines for a bunch of different reasons. And as you point out, one of the things you can do is plant some milkweed, you know, give them give them a place to complete their life cycle, uh, you know, for generation during the summer. Um, the other interesting thing about monarchs is that monarchs are absolutely thriving in the world that we've created as a species. And there are monarchs in something like 20 different countries with permanent populations, and they're spreading into like 20 other ones. Uh, they're in Hawaii, they're in Australia, they're moving into Europe, they're moving into the Middle East. This is actually a super like survivor species that is actually developing year round populations in Florida and possibly Texas as well. And so it's an interesting microcosm for this conversation about sort of change and what change looks like. A lot of people understandably are very concerned about the loss of this migratory population, which we're accustomed in, in uh, sort of the temperate North America seeing in the summertime coming and visiting us and, and completing its life cycle there, which is awesome. Um, yet at the species level, monarchs are doing really, really well. And so both of those things are true at the same time, which sort of makes us sort of, you know, ask questions about, well, what is the future going to look like? And, you know, does it make a difference to me that monarchs are thriving in Australia if I don't see them in my backyard? Um, I think that's a perfect segue into um, what you have mentioned towards the end of the book. And I think it is a quote from um, somebody you interviewed where um, you talk about that the evolution is happening and it is happening, maybe not to your liking. <laughs> and what is, you know, you may not agree with what is going on and, and, and that does not have to be the case. Um, and so you may not see the monarchs here in North America, but they might be somewhere else too. Oftentimes, I also feel that we're, we're so eager, and, and especially if you care deeply about, about nature and, and conservation, like many of us here probably do, um, as they decided to show up for this conversation, um, we want to do something big and something something significant and something, you know, like, I, I want to raise monarchs, right? Uh, awesome. And, and, I do um, it. <laughs> and, and a lot of times the answer is basically just doing little things, simple things, right? It, as, as simple as like create a bio biodiversity in your backyard, plant the native plants, make sure you have some milkweed and don't put the pesticides. It's not something significantly big as do you have to, you know, go into this like mode where you're going to just single handedly save the species, which also people have done save the species yeah. single, you know? And I think one of the points you're getting at is that in conservation, it becomes demoralizing if we feel like we're never making any progress. And so we need to sort of balance out sort of lofty uh, aspirations with being able to, to see tangible progress along the way. 
and and I think that's good. I think we should we should be you know figuring out ways to sort of balance those two things out so that we don't get you know sort of fall into despair in a way that creates that sort of sense of paralysis. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm going to wait for a minute or so if anybody has any questions, but I do have a question as personally to you as to what's next. So uh, I have just landed here at NYU. I've been here for two months now. Um, and so I was, I, I used to run a conservation organization. I've done a bunch of different things, but um, uh, now that I'm here at NYU, um, I'm teaching, which I absolutely love doing. So I will be teaching um, students in the environmental studies department here. Um, I'm still working on a bunch of research projects, particularly around corals and how coral reefs evolve and adapt uh, in our changing world. Um, and uh, I'm asking myself if there's another book out there, but I haven't quite settled on whether, uh, on whether I'm going to do that yet. Awesome. Well, if there is a book, um, I would love to hear about it in the future. <laughs> um, one final question for me. Did I say my last question was final? Because that was a to total lie. Um, <laughs> I think Peg also mentions that in my community, two habitat aids um, are no mome. Oh, I love no mome. I mean, uh, our, our community went crazy over no mome. Um, and there is a there is I think the ordinance um, village ordinance that you cannot have your grass grow uh, over certain inches and they they didn't ticket anybody just for May as soon as June came whoever has not mowed got the tickets so um, uh, but no more May and leave the leaves which is I think for fall um, are some of the wonderful ways to just help out the little critters in 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 insects um, thrive. Um, so my, my final question to you is, can we slow down the extension? Yeah, yeah, we, we probably already have. Um, and I've been meaning to pull some numbers together. There was, uh, uh, there was an article uh, on the news the other day, a couple of weeks ago about the loss of large animals around the planet. And basically it was saying something like we've lost 70% of um, large animals since the 1960s, which is a shocking number, right? Um, and, and you look at that and you're like, oh my goodness, that's really terrible. Um, and I think that was mostly focused on mammals. Um, but if you actually look at the mammal extinctions since the 1960s, there haven't been that many of them. There have been creatures like the Bramble Chemolomies, which is on a little island off the Great Barrier Reef. And there's like a pipistrelle from some island in the Pacific. Um, uh, there's, I think, a bat that was lost. Um, but in that time period, there actually haven't been that many species level extinctions. And you know, I want to dig into these data, um, but I, like I said, I haven't yet, but I think part of the reason is that is because we're trying to prevent them. Because, you know, people don't want gorillas to go extinct. People don't want blue whales to go extinct. And we've gotten to a point in our sort of um, history where people mount concerted active campaigns to save the things that we care about. And we're pretty good at it. Now, obviously they're not always successful. We can't stop all things. We can't stand all, all um, development. We certainly haven't gotten in front of climate change in a meaningful enough way yet. But when we try to save a particular species or a particular place, we're pretty good at it. And I think that's, I think that's something to celebrate that again, we don't necessarily often do that in conservation, which is realize that we are making a difference uh, right now. Now, you can't have trajectories like loss of this percent go on forever without extinctions building up. You can't have climate change spiral out of control for the next, you know, thousand years and not lose other things as well. So I don't want to be Pollyanna about this. Um, we certainly haven't done everything, but we've done a lot to help those organisms that we, that, that we choose to. And again, this gets back to the concept of agency. We're not at this point in our history where we've lost a large fraction of Earth's species diversity. Almost all the species that were there a thousand years ago are there today. And what that means is we get to choose. We have the power to choose what we do locally, what we do regionally, and what we do globally. And again, I tend to find that empowering rather than sort of paralytic. That makes me feel so hopeful. Um, just, just the fact that you know what you mentioned is that you know it's 
the thousand years ago, whatever is is still going on. And I and I hope that that we have not reached a point of no return, which is what I hear. Um, so music to yeah, my I ear. don't think so. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I want to give a quick um, uh, shout out on what is happening at Urban Ecology Center. We have, if you do want to have your own little piece of conservation efforts, um, you can join us for uh, our land stewardship volunteering opportunities that are um, Monday through weekend, actually. And then we also have a Nordic uh, walking uh, workshop for beginners on Saturdays that's happening um, starting this Saturday. So um, go to the urbanecology.org website and check those out. And Michael, thank you so much. This was such a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed it. Well, I enjoyed it too. And thank you for bringing such excellent questions. Thank you both so much. Uh, we are uh, in grateful for this wonderful conversation. Well, thank you so much. Have a nice evening. Thanks everyone for joining.